Well, well, thank you. I haven't. Uh, I haven't. You did a little cap. It's fine. Um, so it's great to be here. Um, so I'm just going to talk about. It is true that there's a bit of a motor emphasis here, um, and I know that you guys have uh, more of an aphasia interest. Um, I do hope there'll be some parallels. Uh, you know, I am friends with aphasia people, um, both here, obviously, at Hopkins, and Alex Leff, and Kathy Price, and Jenny Crinian, and others. Um, in fact, I was just with Alex Leff at a meeting a couple of days ago, and we were talking a lot about the parallels between uh, the rehabilitation of aphasia and of motor um, deficits after stroke. So uh, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, there's the book on the right, shameless plug, um, and then the website for BLAM on the left. So um, it's very up to date. So any papers that you are interested in, I think you should be able to find there, plus uh, all my media appearances. <laughs> Anyway, let's get on. Um, so uh, we're interested in stroke in humans, always, although we do have a mouse model that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and I think stroke is particularly devastating in humans, uh, even more than our closest primate relatives, uh, because of the... You... It's, it's working on the real screen, but it's not working right now. Oh, it isn't? Well, we can only see you. Oh, right. well, that's a problem. That's not good. So how do you, oh, one second, guys. What do you suggest we do? Um, how did that happen? I don't know. Like a wow, that's not usually what I do. Um, so, um, so humans are unusual. They're very, very dependent on their cortical spinal tract. Um, so it's from when you're healthy and reproducing, uh, your cortical spinal tract is the best of any primate, but if you have a stroke, um, and I hope I don't ruin things by pointing at this. Well, I don't really have a pointer here. Oh, there I do. Yeah, yes, I do. So you can have a stroke anywhere along the course of the cortical spinal tract. So here we are over the convexity, and then the cortical spinal tract goes through the peduncle in the midbrain, through the basis pontus, through the medulla, and then it crosses and down into the spinal cord. So this is the hypertrophied, over-evolved single pathway in humans, that if you get a stroke anywhere along its pathway, you get a very similar phenotype, which is a hemiparesis on the other side. So uh, remember this green line going through all these different regions, and then you can see here strokes, basically, this is from a database of our own, strokes uh, that you can see on the diffusion-weighted images all the way along that pathway. So up on the convexity, and then we're here down in the medulla, the internal capsule, pons, you get the message that uh, all these patients, by the way, had um, a severe contralateral hemiplegia, all right? Um, so really stroke is a hemiparesis, I should say, is a disease of the cortical spinal tract in particular. Obviously, when we're talking about other stroke disorders like aphasia and neglect and apraxia, we're talking about cortical syndromes, but stroke is really a white matter descending pathway deficit. And we all know what that looks like. We've all seen patients uh, with stroke and this is the classic uh, chronic flexor synergy stroke pattern. All right, and you've seen these patients in the clinic, in the street, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, this is a stroke I like, uh, a slide I like, which is basically showing that when you ask patients who are at stroke risk but have not had a stroke, and you ask them on a rating of zero to 10, what would be the worst outcome if they would have a stroke? Motor is considered the worst possible outcome, more than death, more than cognition, more than language, which is fascinating, right? And these were over 100, 200 patients. Um, so not to be a motor chauvinist, but it's just, there it is, all right? Um, okay, uh, so uh, unfortunately, and this is true also I think for aphasia, uh, patients um, are undertreated and left alone too much early after strokes. Mm -hmm. A famous study by um, Julie Bernhardt, already famous, 
called Inactive and Alone, and they basically looked at patients within the first two to three weeks after stroke, and unfortunately they spent about 85% of their time inactive and 60% of their time inactive and 85% of their time alone. Okay, so we pride ourselves on these hospitals, but they're suboptimal for enrichment of humans. Okay, so motor recovery after stroke, we have a bigger issue than you do uh, in the aphasia field because, of course, you can't study aphasia in animals. Um, but we can study motor recovery in animals. And then when we do that, we get into trouble because we don't know what we can apply to humans and what we can't apply to humans. Um, now, this was a problem that was appreciated in the early 20th century, late 19th, uh, okay, so where- what you're telling me. Uh, who's that? <laughs> Someone talking? Hmm. All right. Uh, so, I think that's somebody over there. All right. Um, so, what we, I, we'd like to make a case here at Hopkins, and I'm always boring my lab members about, is we need to be much more physiologically minded uh, and much more aware of what's going in in neuroscience when we try and do uh, applied rehab in humans. And unfortunately, neurologists seem to be much better at this a century ago uh, than we are today. Um, again, this is more of a problem, uh, I think, for motor disorder. Um, and then the other thing that we're big on, and I, you know, I was talking to Alex Leff about this, we were at this meeting um, about needing to quantify in continuous space the deficit. In other words, using clinical scales isn't sufficient anymore. If we want to get to the neuroscience and get restitution, we need measures that match the ambition of the intervention. Um, and we think that the proper level of granularity to have a match between the intervention and the outcome is kinematics. In other words, the, the geometry um, of the movements themselves. We say kinematics, uh, you can also say kinetics. In other words, forces and accelerations. Uh, we're not averse to that, and you could even go for EMG. Uh, but we think that in task space, you can get most of the information um, from the kinematics. Um, in language, I think that must be some kind of trajectory in recovery space uh, that you get from some kind of multidimensional data set from healthy subjects would be my guess. But a trajectory that you can measure um, in cognitive space is more difficult, I think, than what we have, which is we can do it in physical space. Um, and then, you know, we believe that in all of restorative neurology, uh, you must have some kind of primary behavioral experience that you can then leverage uh, adjuncts on top of. So whether it's drugs, whether it's brain stimulation, if you rely on those and you don't have a good behavioral intervention to begin with, um, it's gonna fail in my view. Uh, I think unfortunately in our field, there's a belief that we can continue to give um, these original OT and PT treatments and turn them into super treatments just by doing brain stimulation or giving a drug. It's completely backwards. You've got to get a really original new behavioral intervention and then you worry about doing brain stimulation um, or giving drugs. Now I am I'm not knowledgeable enough to know whether that's true in the aphasia space. I suspect that it is, um, but it certainly seems to be the case for motor rehabilitation. Um, now, the problem for human stroke, because it seems to be about having given too much responsibility to the cortical spinal tract in humans, um, is that the consequence of that is we're dexterous piano players in health, but we're devastated if the cortical spinal tract gets interrupted in a way that monkeys and mice are not. Um, and what that means is, is that stroke from the motor standpoint in humans is a double disease. It's a negative disease, it's weakness and dexterity loss, and it's a movement disorder as well. It's a positive disease. So we have to deal with a movement disorder like Parkinson's or Huntington's and 
a deficit disorder as is seen mainly in monkeys and mice. And that's been appreciated for over a century with the negative symptoms and the positive symptoms coined by Hewlings Jackson at the end of the uh, 19th century. Uh, and then uh, a Queen Square neurologist, FMRR Walsh, uh, writing in the early 20th century, uh, also spoke about this dual nature of hemiplegia, the combination of loss of voluntary movement and the intrusion of positive phenomena, spasticity and synergies. Right. So in other words, and I would argue that we have a very hard problem, hard not to crack because we have to deal with separate treatments for the negative and the positive symptoms, which has not been appreciated, I think, sufficiently even now. And it's somewhat reminiscent of the difference between negative and positive symptoms in schizophrenia, which need quite different um, pharmacological intervention. So the positive symptoms are synergies, and a synergy just means a pattern of involuntary obligatory co-activation of muscles or joints. So this patient might want just to move their wrist and then they get unwanted uh, movement in the flexor direction at their elbow and shoulder that goes along for the ride. So this is very annoying because you can't isolate any particular joint, uh, which is what the cortical spinal tract is consummately good at. It fractionates movements across joints and keeps others silent. If you try and move one finger and keep all the others still, the credit should go to your cortical spinal tract. Um, so what do we do about these synergies? Well, first we need to characterize them. And uh, in 1951, a very famous paper was written uh, that basically tracked about 25 patients as they went from plegia to almost complete recovery and Thomas Twitchell basically scored their progression uh, through these unwanted flexor and extensor synergies. Again, synergies meaning unwanted co-activation across joints and muscles. Um, and this was his recovery sequence. So he basically, the patients were plegic, and then they began to be able to flex a little bit at the shoulder. Then they began to be able to flex a little bit at the elbow. And then they began to get some flexion at the wrist and fingers. And then they began to be able to get some extension, but that extension was at the shoulder and elbow simultaneously, which makes it a extensor synergy. And then they began to be able to do extension and flexion out of synergy. These are the lucky patients who can get through these previous stages. And then eventually you can do finger individuation. Now, there's a lot of inter individual variability, but nevertheless, there seems to be some pattern to this march through control of the limb and being able to defeat uh, these intrusive synergies so that you could move in and out of the synergies and individuate the digits. This is 1951, all right? And here we are in 2018, and we still don't know what the neurophysiological basis is for this intrusive synergy and why we get better from it. I mean, we have some ideas I'll talk about, but it's still wide open. And then there was a Fugelmeyer scale that was devised in the 1970s to try and put a number to this set of synergies and your escape from them. So in the upper limb, for example, you, the best score is 66 when you can do everything fine. And then as you get lower and lower, you're worse and your synergies um, are worse. And then if you get to a score of zero, you're basically plegic. And then in 1989, I mean, what am I saying? In 2008, <laughs> We basically came up with a mathematical rule to this regularity, which I'll talk about a little bit today, and we called it proportional recovery. And basically what we argued um, was that there was a expected amount of recovery on the Fugelmeyer scale that you could expect to get as a function of your initial deficit. So there was some regularity to how far you could march through that sequence that Twitchell described um, over time. Uh, and that rule is that you'll get about 70% of your maximal potential Fugelmeyer scale um, over three months. All right. Now, that's interesting because it's telling us something about the biology of recovery. Um, it's not so clear what we should do to beat that rule. Um, and so far, no one has been able to beat that rule in terms of an intervention even early, including us. Um, 
This is an experiment done just to show, uh, this is done actually uh, by Kathy Zakowski and Amy Bastian and colleagues here at Hopkins, that these synergies are annoying. They actually get in the way and that they're not a deficit, they're an intrusion. So what Amy and colleagues did is that they had a patients sit in a chair like you see there, and then they had them reach out to either target position number one or reach up to target position number two. Now that was clever because the anti-gravity requirement is the same. You have to lift up your arm in both cases. But they posited that in fact you would do better lifting your arm up to a higher position because it would be within the flexor synergy. In other words, you need to flex the shoulder and elbow. Whereas position one would be more difficult because you need to flex at the shoulder, but you need to extend at the elbow. In other words, you have to make an out of synergy movement. And so that inability to shut down that flex of synergy will be apparent in your inability to get to target number one. And that's exactly what they found. So if you look at a control subject here, they can move easily up to target one and they can move out to target two, target vice versa, sorry. And you can see that the patients are quite good at that lifting up to hit the target when they can do it within synergy. But as soon as they have to control their elbow independently of the shoulder, they break down. Okay, so it's a very nice example of something unwanted intruding rather than something you can't do. And more recently, in the monkey, there's been work to suggest that this flexor synergy is actually being generated by a subcortical nucleus or set of nuclei called the reticular formation. And that they, and, and an upregulation of the reticular formation is actually responsible for this intrusion that in some patients can swamp the presence of the cortical spinal tract. So here, what Stuart Baker and colleagues did is that they lesion the pyramidal tract. This is the level of the medulla on one side. And then they stimulated the ipsilateral medial longitudinal fasciculus, which contains the reticular spinal tract. And they recorded from motor neurons in the forearm and hand to see what the state of responsiveness of those forearm motor neurons was to a fixed level of stimulation of the reticular spinal tract. And what they found interestingly that they lesioned and then they waited about three to six months and they looked before and after. White is before and gray is after. And I think you can see that there seems to be considerable upregulation in the forearm flexors, not in the extensors and in some of the intrinsic hand muscles. So that, and this pattern of upregulation of the reticular formation mimics the muscles that are most active in human flexor synergies. So the conclusion was that maybe the flexor synergies are due to a similar upregulation in the reticular formation as was seen in this monkey model with the pyramidal tract lesion. Okay, so that's the story in the last couple of years is that this intrusive positive symptomatology after stroke is attributable to some upregulation of unwanted subcortical structures that have been allowed to misbehave because they're no longer under uh, cortical control, all right? And this is the reticular formation. It's very interesting. The reticular spinal tract, the origins of the reticular spinal tract are more diffuse. So in other words, they're bilateral in their origin. They can come from premotor regions and sensory regions. And so, and then they decussate in the reticular formation bilaterally. So it's a very bilaterally organized system. So you can see that it's going to be more resistant to a stroke than the more focal contralaterally located cortical spinal tract. All right, so it's distributed in a way that makes it a little bit more immune to the effects of a single unilateral lesion. All right, so that's the intrusive story. And as I said, despite an enormous interest over a century in treating synergies and postures and spasticity, it hasn't gotten us anywhere, all right? And then there are the negative symptoms. Now the negative symptoms are more interesting to a lot of scientists because they're more easily modeled in monkeys and in mice. And the 
parallels are easier to make. It, despite what I just told you about the upregulation of the reticular spinal tract in the monkey, monkeys don't actually exhibit synergies anywhere near as much as humans do. And you might ask yourself, why is that? And that might well be because they have an intact rubrous spinal tract that can take the modulatory role of the cortical spinal tract. But because, as I said, humans are so cortical spinal tract centric, we've atrophied our rubrous spinal tract. Um, so anyway, it's a complicated story. Um, so here's the cortical spinal tract again. Um, as you saw in that experiment by Stuart Baker, there was a lesion in the pyramid. That has been the tradition in the study of the cortical spinal tract for over a century, is that you actually put the lesion in the pyramid here. There. That's where one tends to, in the experimental monkey system, put the lesion, because at that point, the cortical spinal tract is quite pure. You've lost the cortico bulbar pathways mostly, and the rubro reticulo and vestibular spinal tracts are more rostral. Now, the most uh, one very famous study, which is underappreciated, unfortunately, nowadays, was a single author study. Sarah Tower, a Hopkins medical student and graduate student who studied the effect of pyramidal lesions in the monkey um, because she was particularly interested to know in the stroke phenotype what can be attributed to the cortical spinal tract and what needs some other credit. And that's where, as I like to tell everyone, the term extra pyramidal came from, which is what part of the stroke phenotype cannot be blamed on the inhibition, the lesioning of the cortical spinal tract, right? And what she found was that she couldn't find very many positive symptoms in the monkeys after lesioning the cortical spinal tract, right? So there was an argument between the neurologists and the physiologists like Sarah Tower about, well, where on earth are the positive synergies coming from? Because when we lesion the pyramidal tract, uh, we only get the negative symptom, right? And hence, there was the search for the extra pyramidal origins of the extra pyramidal symptoms. Interestingly, in humans, again, speaking to the strange dominance of the cortical spinal tract in humans, if you have a pure pyramidal lesion after stroke in humans, which is rare, it does happen, um, and you look at the literature on that, you don't see much mention of synergies, maybe because they didn't look. Maybe kind of annoying. But they do see um, spasticity. Um, so already there's a divergence between the pyramidal lesion effect in the monkey and in the human. And then there's another famous uh, study in 68, which did lesions bilaterally of the pyramidal tract but unlike Sarah Tower, they went lesioning elsewhere to see whether they could get the other symptoms. Um, and the bottom line is that just like Sarah Tower found, um, the cortical spinal tract lesion in the pyramid causes negative symptoms, loss of dexterity at the hand. Sarah Tower actually pointed out loss of dexterity proximally. But otherwise they did very well with the pyramid, you know, five months after bilateral pyramidotomy, they were jumping around the cage. They could reach up and pull down handles like you see there. Um, but they did have loss of dexterity um, and you don't see synergies. They certainly weren't commented on very much. Um, so that's the story of the negative symptoms. It seems to be due to loss of the cortical spinal tract. Uh, and then the positive symptoms from later monkey work suggests that there's upregulation of the reticular spinal tract. So basically, the cortical spinal tract goes down, the reticular spinal tract goes up, and then you're left with the human stroke phenotype. Um, support for that view um, comes from interesting work by Jules DeWald and others, where they find that if you check what the workspace area is of a weight-supported arm, so if all of you were to have your arm on a air hockey sled, basically, and you moved around on a tabletop, you'd have that big, as you see on the right, range of motion, right? You could basically sweep your arm out over this space. But if you have a stroke, even though your arm's fully supported, 
um, if you're, I'm sorry, if you have a, with a stroke and you don't have weight support of your arm, you just have this little scrunched area to work in like that. But if you start to increasingly support the weight of the arm with a robot, so you don't have to support that yourself, as you get more and more weight support out of the plane, your area of arm reaching increases. So like magic, just supporting the shoulder in terms of weight support suddenly allows, sorry, the elbow to extend. It's very important to understand this point. No support is being given by the robot in the extension domain. All the support is happening at the level of the shoulder and weight support. And yet magically, as you support the weight of the shoulder, your elbow begins to gain control again and your workspace starts to expand. Okay, so this is interpreted to mean that the, the reticular spinal tract is trying to do weight support. It's not under control of the cortical spinal tract anymore, and therefore it gets out of control and it intrudes upon the ability of the residual cortical spinal tract to extend the elbow. But as you reduce its upregulation because the weight support requirement is reduced, you can actually get exposure. You know, you unmask the residual cortical spinal tract. It's quite profound, actually. So you, it looks like stroke is this competition between the re residual cortical spinal tract and an upregulated subcortical system. Um, and this is work that we've recently been doing, just showing further that this intrusive movement disorder and the underlying control deficit can uncouple. Um, so basically doing reaches on a table surface to eight targets, all of you would look like the controls in gray. And then you see chronic patients and acute patients. And what Alkis had Joseph, a postdoc in the lab, has done here is sort of arranged them as a function of the positive symptoms, the Fugelmeyer, and matched them. And what you can see is that even though the Fugelmeyer is similar, for example, here, the positive symptoms, and here, in fact, if anything, the green is worse, nevertheless, the control is worse with the lower fugal Meyer score here than there. And you can quantify that here, and you can basically see this uncoupling between the dexterity measure on the table and the intrusive fugal Meyer measure. All right. So we have a problem that we need to train the deficit, but in order to train the deficit, we need to peel away the movement disorder. We can peel away the movement disorder with weight support but we don't know how to peel away the movement disorder in any therapeutic way. Um, so I'm not quite sure what we're going to do about that. At the moment, my best bet is that if we go super early in a, with a high intensity treatment, we might be able to prevent the upregulation of the reticular spinal tract by doing maximal rescue on the cortical spinal tract. But that is a hypothetical question still. Um, so again, in line with what I just said, that maybe if you go super early, you might be able to prevent all this nonsense. Uh, we've been studying, uh, in the mouse, uh, the dimensions and the properties of a window of opportunity, uh, which, uh, is nicely demonstrated in the mouse. And this is Steve Zyler, who has a K award with me and is an assistant professor here at Hopkins. Um, so a lot of people have been say, making the case and you're just going to have to trust me for now, that there are some homologies at the behavioral and neural level between rodents when they reach and humans when they reach. Uh, and so since the 1980s, uh, there's been a lot of work with motor cortical lesions in the rodent at uh, reaching, usually towards a pellet or a spaghetti, a capellini, actually. So this is um, Steve's work. This is showing uh, that a mouse actually does have a little hand and can become quite dexterous. This is when they're pre-trained, so they're not very good. So this is a fail, right? But over time, they can get quite good, pick up the pellet in one go and put it in its mouth without any of that tongue action. Um, this is where you can put the stroke in the mouse. So you can do an endothelin one occlusive lesion over the convexity um, and get a motor cortical stroke. And there it is. And then after that stroke, you pre-train them on that prehension task to a criterion. 
and then you give the stroke. So here it is, they get up to about 55%, 60% efficacy. It's difficult for them to become dexterous with this pellet task. And then you give them the stroke and they have a deficit. And then you can rehabilitate them on that same task for weeks and they never get back. So this is important because it suggests that this is a cortically dependent behavior in the rodent. And even if you train them every day for three weeks on this task, you ca they can't find a way to compensate and get their performance back up. Okay, there's some recovery, uh, but they cannot reach out and pick up this pellet um, without this cortical dependent pathway. Okay, now what Steve asked is, what about if he starts training right away rather than waiting that week that you can see there between the stroke and the resumption of training? And if you do that, dramatically, you get a return to normal behavior. So that's really very nice, right? That is somewhat congruent with earlier work by Dale Corbett and colleagues showing that an enriched environment uh, allowed earlier recovery than if the enriched recovery environment were placed later, okay? So very, I think, dramatic demonstration that if you don't wait after injury, you can get much more bang for your buck training trial by training trial. Um, now, the nice paradoxical result of this is that it suggests that maybe you can reopen that window by giving an animal a second stroke, even though it's waited too long before it started rehab the first time. And so Steve did that. So he basically gave them a stroke, waited that week again, again showed that they couldn't get back to normal. Then he expanded their infarct by infarcting their premotor cortex. You'll see that they originally get worse and then they go back to normal. So this is a very paradoxical result that you can actually make a mouse better from its first stroke by giving it another motor stroke, which originally makes it worse, but then you don't wait that second time around and now you can get them back to the way they were. Okay, so a very dramatic, I think, demonstration that there is some training responsive window that you can open with a ski mirror itself, but it closes quite fast. Now it's not non-specific because if you infarct, for example, occipital cortex, like Steve did, you get no response. You just stay where you were with the training before. Again, proving that even if you go up to a month of training, uh, you can't compensate for the initial deficit. So there's a lot in this experiment. One, um, that this is a cortical dependent behavior and compensation doesn't seem to cut it. Two, that there's a window of opportunity and it's a training dependent window. Uh, this is also true in monkeys. So this is a study going back to 2008. Um, and basically, I won't go into great detail here. Suffice to say that uh, this monkey here <coughs> was not trained on a food well. So here's the training. You basically can force these monkeys early after stroke to have to be accurate to get the pellets out of, out of these wells. So in other words, you enforce a dexterity requirement. This is the equivalent of the pellet reaching task in the mouse. So imagine training every day on that. Um, if you wait before you start training here, they wait in a month, then that dexterous ability disappears. So the, it, here's the pink bar here. This is before, they can, pink means dexterous. It's this kind of movement, you give them a stroke and you just let them be in their cage and they don't spontaneously recover the pink behavior. They, they learn a partially competent compensatory behavior. All right, so they plateau about there. In contrast, if you train them on the well every day, like we train the mouse, slowly over time, the pink behavior starts to creep in, okay? Until you get dramatic return of that behavior. And incidentally, it's not here. If you start trying to train that poor monkey now on the pellet, this task, it's too late. So mouse and monkey, lots and lots of movement quality related training, window of opportunity with quite dramatic results if you do it at high enough dose and intensity. What about humans? Well, I'll tell you that with the exception of a trial that we did and a trial that another group did, which I'll talk about a little bit, 
um, it's never been attempted. So even though we've known this uh, for decades, if not longer, in fact, Sherrington and Leighton and others said that this needed to be done in humans, it's never been done. Something about rehabilitation in the West seems to be obsessed with teaching you to cope rather than trying to teach you to recover. And then what they do is that they add brain stimulation on top of coping strategies in some bizarre attempt uh, to get you to restitute even though the treatment at the behavioral level is compensatory. Completely bizarre. Um, so we basically tracked patients in a natural history study in order to then devise a treatment. It was called SMARTS. It was done in New York, uh, Zurich, and here in Baltimore. I'm just going to show you um, a little piece of it. This is by Juan Camino Cortez, who was a fellow and is now a resident. And he used a planar motor control reaching task to look rather like that DeWald study at the quality of people's movements. Those are the trajectories that all of you would show if you were to do it. And stroke patients look like that. So even here, there's 100% weight support. So in other words, this is even when you've gotten that reticular intrusion minimized to the most we can, you still have this deficit, the negative deficit, all right? And basically what Juan Camilo did is he tracked what that negative deficit does over time after stroke uh, using a way of uh, doing dimensionality reduction on the trajectories uh, so that you can end up with a sort of scalar quantity to describe those trajectories, which I won't talk about now. It's very important though to be able to quantify these trajectories and come up with a scalar because that allows you to actually have a distance um, from normality. I mean, a lot of people will say, unless you completely train the patients back to normal, how do you know they're on their way back to normal, right? And this comes up with trajectories in aphasia space as well. And basically, if you have a scalar value, you can actually say what your distance is in a multidimensional space from healthy, all right? So basically, how far are you going from here towards looking like that? So if my arrow was the scalar quantity, what about if I got halfway between here and here? Could I say that, even though you'd still be abnormal? And interestingly, if you take that scalar value based on the dimensionality reduction on the time series of the trajectories, you can see that if you take that value, people are do almost all their recovery over the first four weeks. And then they essentially flatline. Okay, so this window in humans, it was about a week in the mouse, looks like about four weeks in the human. And just so you understand this plot, here's the scalar value, the Malhonovis distance here for controls. So there's not a sensitivity issue with the test. You have all this space that you could improve in that we could detect. We know we can detect it because this is the controlled population and the unaffected limb. And yet you don't fill that space. Right, so that's bad news, right? It means that we've got the problem of the intrusion of the positive phenomenology, and then we have this unresponsiveness of the negative symptoms after about a month. Um, and then this is just to show dissociation between this flatlining of the negative symptoms very early. This is week five normalized. And then the others, strength, Fugelmeyer and the ARAT continue to improve over time. So this speaks to the importance of dissecting uh, the components of the paretic deficit. It's also true for the hand. So this is Jing Chu, who's a postdoc with us and is now faculty. And she looked, instead of at the arm, she looked at the hand over time and she divided the hand's ability into individuation and power grip. So all of you who use your hands, basically have this range of dexterity where you can move one finger and none of the others to a bit of both using chopsticks. You have to be precise and apply force to complete grip force without dexterity. And you all see in your patients at the bedside, you can grip your hand, but can't move their fingers. Okay. It's still a mystery. What descending system is responsible for power grip versus the corticospinal tract for individuation. Now, um, with Jorn Diedrichsen in London, who's now at Western, 
um, we used a isometric finger individuation keyboard to actually study the time course of individuation and strength over time after stroke. I won't go into detail in the interest of time, just show you that you can quantify and you can get paths, um, uh, trajectories for the hand as well. Uh, so you have strength on the left, the black curve is the patients here. Again, they do most of their recovery early and here's dexterity and here's a control side. And what's important is that this dexterity measure, the way we did it, is independent of the strength measure. Okay, so we were able to orthogonalize control from strength. And then you take these orthogonalized measures and you can actually look at them through recovery space. Um, and basically you get this very interesting piecewise linear function relating strength and dexterity. And again, it's, this is not the X and this is the Y. In other words, the dexterity is not a function of strength. These are two independent measures and we're just showing their relationship to each other um, at any point in time. Okay, and basically showing that as you improve your strength, some other system that's doing that is also got some dexterity and then your strength can, can, be, can keep improving with your dexterity flat lines. Okay, so purely based on psychophysics, you can begin to discern the existence of a system with some dexterity, but mostly strength, and then a second system that has riding on top of it just dexterity and not much strength. So in essence, by careful behavioral dissection, you can infer the existence of a cortical spinal tract and a separate subcortical system, right? So quite beautiful that behavioral work can still infer the existence of subsystems in the nervous system. And you can see this actually in a film that Jing made where she basically took two patients in this, so this space of strength and dexterity and showed their progression through this very interestingly shaped uh, recovery space. So if you look, there's a red and a yellow dot there. One patient is severe, the other one is mild, and you'll see that they have very different trajectories through this space. So one out of sample moves through this space and the other one is stuck. All right, kind of beautiful. Anyway, so what are we saying here? Well, we're saying that in the normal brain, there's a normal level of plasticity and the brain is unlesioned. In the chronic state, the brain is damaged, but your plasticity is at normal levels. And it's only early that you have this hyperplasticity that is ischemia related that increases the responsiveness to training, right? So in other words, we have to find a way through behavioral intervention to exploit this window and somehow find a treatment for the positive symptoms and somehow find a treatment for the negative symptoms, right? Now, before I get to that, I just want to show you a slide of things that I think have been paths that shouldn't have been taken. And the reason behind it, there are many, but the basic one is, is this point here, that once you get to the chronic stage, you have a hole in your head and your plasticity levels are normal. And what I'm basically gonna say is you can't with normal plasticity and a hole in your head, learn your way out of trouble, okay? No more than you'd say to a Parkinson's patient um, or a toxic patient, that you just need to learn your way out of trouble, okay? Otherwise, they would have done that. So on, with that in mind, these are the directions that, at least in motor rehabilitation, I think should just be stopped. Any talk about use-dependent plasticity, okay? It's a red herring. Motor learning. So the idea that learning is the way that you're going to get out of trouble after a stroke it's just wrong. Changes in interhemispheric imbalance. In other words, in the motor system, there's this belief that your healthy hemisphere double lesions the healthy hemisphere, the, the damaged hemisphere by inhibiting it. So you poor old stroke hemisphere has a lesion and it's being unkindly inhibited by the healthy hemisphere. Not true. 
uh, changing in motor cortical excitability, huge interest in TDCS uh, to sort of increase the amplitude of MEPs, suggesting that that somehow in itself is going to make you better. Not true. Changes in cortical maps, lots of interest in cortical maps expanding and shrinking. Uh, cortical maps are an epiphenomena, right? They are actually not causally relevant to recovery, nor are they actually always seen with recovery. I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions is that map changes are actually causally relevant. And then resting state and fun functional connectivity um, also theoretically, I think, a bit bankrupt. And at, we have looked at it um, and found no evidence that recovery after motor stroke has any relationship to functional connectivity across multiple cortical regions. But as you can see from that list, I've basically nastily, cruelly, dismissively gotten rid of most of the research in this area. Right? <laughs> but I would claim that it was technique driven rather than concept driven. And so non-embracive brain stimulation for the motor system, uh, TMS and TGCS and robotics in addition are likely to have minimal therapeutic use. For motor recovery. Again, I'm not going to make equivalently sweeping statements for depression, pain, or language. Um, what do I think is important then? Well, if people who've looked in monkey models have shown, this is a study by Warren Darling, they did a big stroke over here in the dorsal and premotor and the prime motor cortex, and then they looked at upregulation of projections to the spinal cord from the SMA. So this is the projections from the SMA before the stroke, and here they are after the stroke. And it's very interesting that you get upregulation of the strength of these final projections from the sensory motor area, the SMA, supplemental motor area. And what's nice is that what they did in this monkey model is they then did a second lesion in the supplementary motor area and they recapitulated the deficit. So in other words, they could make somewhat of a causal claim to this upregulation of the spinal cord projections of the supplementary motor area, because when they introduced a second lesion, you actually recapitulated the deficit. And, we, and Steve Zion actually did something very similar in the supplementary motor area equivalent in the mouse, where what you saw that recovery that I showed you before, if he then introduced a second lesion into that region, you lost the deficit, the, the initial recovery. All right. Similarly, John Buford in a monkey model compared in a reaching task, in other words, um, the effect of a large and a small stroke and looked for map changes around the lesion here in black and found none that were either there or relevant, yeah. but the monkey and nevertheless with training got better and the culprit seems to be upregulation of the right pontomedullary reticular formation on the contralesional side. So the story, at least for motor stroke, like I said at the beginning, that is a corticospinal tract disease, is it's not a east-west cortico-cortical problem. It's a north-south cortico-subcortical spinal cord problem. And all the rearrangement that is actually causally relevant is happening at the level of the brainstem and the spinal cord and its relationships with the cortical spinal tract. So that led us to an equation which we wrote in the book about recovery um, after stroke, which I feel, and this is a bold statement, um, that this equation actually can summarize for the motor system what's happening in the monkey, the mouse, and the human. Okay, and that if you go looking at the literature through the lens of this equation, it will actually make sense. So I challenge you to find me a case where this doesn't work. So basically we're saying that restitution, in other words, the magnitude of your return to normality is a multiplicative function of the behavior. In other words, the dose of training multiplied by the residual architecture you have that projects to the spinal cord. So for example, the SMA was residual architecture with its own projections to the ventral horn multiplied by what your level of plasticity is, which as we say, modulates as a function of time from the initial stroke. So if you have a very small lesion in the motor cortex, so you have residual good 
motor cortical architecture, and you go early, then you don't need that much training and you'll get a lot of spontaneous recovery. If on the other hand, you give them a big lesion and you wipe out, wipe out motor cortex, then in order to get up regulation like we saw in the Warren Darling study with the SMA, we're going to have to give a large dose of training to upregulate that SMA, and we're more likely to be able to do that if our plasticity level is high, which is early after the lesion. And in the animal literature, there's very little attempt to lesion monkeys or mice and then wait large amounts of time before instigating therapy. The longest is, for example, what Steve did, where he waited a week before he resumed training. So here's the problem. We know that there's spontaneous biological recovery um, in the human, green tick. We know there's spontaneous biological recovery in the non-human primate, another green tick. We don't know if there's spontaneous biological recovery in rodents because we tend to use a cortical dependent prehension task to study them. We're not interested in their natural behaviors. Um, we know that the rodent and the non-human primate show increased responsivity to training early. We don't know if that's true in the human. Okay, so here we are 100 years after those original studies showing that you could train early in the primate, but we haven't done it in humans. Okay, so the challenge is to try and do it in humans and try and create what's been done in rodents and enriched environment for humans. We need to get humans to babble in their space of everyday life. In other words, this is where we all live in hand space, all of us with our cell phones, gesturing, knife and fork all live in this cloud. Um, and we need to trick people into being childlike again and to babble in that space because it will be beneficial to many different types of task. And that's what we try to do. And I will simply say that we now with animation try to get people to be inspired to babble. That's me babbling. And so we did a study where we had patients come very early, got them to play the game so that they could do lots and lots of movement in that statistical cloud. I will not go through all the criteria, just to tell you that it worked and failed. We did get better response to treatment in both the babbling dolphin group and the, and the time-matched high-intensity hand and arm therapy with therapists. So in other words, the primary question whether going more earlier is better than current care, unequivocally, yes. So here, for example, is the ARAT, which is the negative symptom test, but no response for the positive symptom test. In other words, the Fugelmeyer, the synergies, did spontaneously recover, but all three groups, the natural, the, 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 the standard of care group, the robot dolphin group, and the matched upper limb therapy group all did the same when it came to the fever mile. Okay, so frustrating because you're somehow having an effect like we've seen in the monkey and the mouse on the negative symptoms in the human. So that bit of the human, which is monkey or mouse-like, the deficit side, seems to be responding like the monkeys um, and the mice, which is good, but we can't seem to get rid of that piece that is unique to the humans because of they've overly relied on the cortical spinal tract for evolutionary reasons. Uh, so I don't know what we're going to do about that. We basically have solved the deficit disorder to some degree, but we've failed to solve the movement disorder. And my suspicion is that stroke is going to need, just like Parkinson's disease did, it's going to need its DBS moment. It's going to be like what Malin DeLong did with monkey models and deep brain stimulation. We're going to have to have the brainstem spinal cord equivalent to that, I suspect, to get rid of the positive symptoms. Um, so this is the problem in summary. You know, we've got these four components uh, to the deficit, the control component, the strength component, the synergy component, and the compensation component. And unfortunately, on the right, under the human, we have those two big question marks. And I would say that the motor control one could have a little bit of a green tick after our trial, that you can get the negative symptoms better in the human. But I'm not convinced that we've yet got that big, bright red question mark under synergy on the right uh, under control. Um,
and I will stop there. So, yes, I will stop there so that you can uh, ask questions if you're allowed to on this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, so I think, I think what, we, uh, uh, what we will do is, uh, if you can take questions from your end of the room first, and then we'll go to USC, and then we'll take questions from our online audience, which can ask questions via the chat box. Does that sound good? Chat box. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and yeah, if, if you can't read that chat box right now, I can read out those questions to you. Yeah, maybe you could do that. Um, or maybe I could move around to my chat box. <laughs> um, okay, I, I don't think... This crowd is sick of me here. I don't think they have any questions for me, to be honest. They might, but yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, TCS as well. I mean, so for example, um, the biggest the question should be possible. Um, Heidi Johansson Berg, where all TCS does is improve motor learning, but it doesn't change the motor control. So. Chronic. So there have only been so there haven't been that many very acute TDCS studies. There have been a few now that have more authors than patients, um, and the effect sizes are not very big. So yes, I would agree with you that one doesn't. It's possible, but uh, maybe. Yeah, we actually we originally had a TDCS arm to our study, but recruitment was so hard we sacrificed it. So. Yes, you're right that it might, through some other mechanism, augment spontaneous recovery, um, but chronically, no. Because for the same reason I said before, you can't learn your way out of trouble. What TDCS does do is it will teach you to compensate faster, because that's just using normal motor learning mechanism. See what I mean? So that's fine. If you just say, look, I want them out of the hospital as fast as possible, I want to teach them to compensate, and I know that TDCS can speed up learning of compensatory skills, so I'll get them out of the hospital even sooner. By all means, use TDCS for certain tasks. You know. Yes. John, if, John, you, if you can repeat the question. question that oh, I'm sorry. So the question before was, um, am I? How do I know that TDCS should be slammed as much as I did? Yeah. And the question was true in so much that there haven't been many studies going super early with TDCS for motor recovery. Um, there have been a couple now and they've been sort of small effect sizes, but that is true, that objection. Um, but in the chronic stage, what TDCS does is simply accelerate learning. And then I'm about to have another question. Yes. Right, so the question was, why did the mouse study focus on a cortical dependent prehension behavior uh, rather than a more natural unlearned behavior in the rodent? Well, as I tried to argue too quickly, the reason why people study prehension in the rodent is it's a cortical dependent behavior. And as you see, you lesion the motor cortex, they never get it back. You can remove the entire cortex sensory motor bilaterally in a rodent and you will see no effect whatsoever on lever pressing, running, walking, any of those things. So it's very impressive, but it's useless as a model of what happens in humans. So there's a trade-off basically. So you say, well, it's a learned behavior versus our equivalent of an unlearned, which is reaching, but for them it's not. But the trade-off has gone in the decision to say that the behavior has to be homologous rather than have a natural behavior that doesn't care about the motor cortex at all. Right. So I think we've exhausted the questions here at Hopkins. <laughs> Any questions, questions from our end? Uh, hi, John. This is Julius Fredrickson. I have a quick question about something that you said earlier. Uh, you talked about that there's something about rehabilitation in the West that we're obsessed with the ability to cope rather than the ability to recover. Did I get that right? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, for people, for people with, let's say, let's say moderate to severe strokes, most of them don't fully recover. Uh, is there anything wrong with focusing on coping? So, okay, I always get that question. So, one, I would argue in two ways, answer in two ways. One is, many patients who are moderate to severe don't recover because they're never given thousands and thousands of training trials very early after stroke. So in other words, there's never been an interest in giving high dose, high intensity, restitution based behavioral therapy early after stroke. Okay, as I showed you in that very first slide, you spend 60% of your time alone and 85% of your time immobile. Right? In that window that seems to be so impressive in the animal studies, you're ignored essentially as a patient. All right? Now let's be clear about what acute rehab is these days. It's one hour of OT, one hour of PT, and one hour of speech. When they've looked, Catherine Lang quantified the number of task-oriented reaches you make in an hour session focused on the upper limb. Have a guess how many you make. The guess, the guess here is 10. <laughs> it's about 20 to 30, and you spend about 11 to 12 minutes of that hour time on task. We know from the work of Randy Nudo and others that you need about 500 goal-directed movements to show any change in cortical plasticity. So we are giving homeopathic doses of <laughs> movement quality care early. So you might be right that there will still be patients who are moderate to severe after a proper intervention, which to this day has never been attempted. And then I would say, and I've written, at that point, and only at that point, once the window is closed, should you move to compensatory coping strategies. Okay, so I got a follow up question to that thing. Um, I definitely agree with you that with regards to conventional rehabilitation, our dosage is, is our dose is pathetically low. And in most cases, it probably doesn't have any effect. But so just to put you on the spot, so you believe that then a patient with a large MCA stroke and major impairment, with, given the proper dose, which might be hundreds of sessions, you think they can reach full recovery? Then? Okay, so again, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, when we did the proportional recovery rule, subsequent work by uh, other groups, uh, particularly Kathy Stinier and Winston Biblo in New Zealand, um, wanted to understand why some severe patients, I didn't speak about this for long enough, but some severe patients show proportional recovery and others don't ever show any. So we were never able to answer why it is that all mild to moderate show some spontaneous recovery. So I, I would challenge any of you ever to show me a patient with mild to moderate hemiparesis that doesn't show some spontaneous recovery. But in the severe group, let's say fugal miles of 10 or below, about 50% of those patients show no recovery, and the other 50% proportionally recover like everybody else. And so what Kathy and Winston showed is that if you do cortical spinal tract integrity measures with TMS and you look at the presence or absence of MEPs, those patients showed no recovery with severe strokes, had absent MEPs, and those patients who went on to recover, even though they had matched initial severity, did have MEPs. So I would say that it may be the case that those patients who don't have MEPs within the first two weeks after stroke are not going to benefit from behavioral therapy alone. They're going to be the equivalent, to my view, of near total spinal cord transection. So a stroke that hits all the descending white matter supratentorially is essentially like having a spinal cord lesion. And there, I don't think that behavior is going to get you out of trouble. But, there's, but they showed that patients, even with fugal myers as low as five, would respond with proportional recovery. So I think we need to do some kind of stratification where in the severe subset, we do TMS and we exclude the MEP minus patients from a behavioral high dose intervention. Um, and that's actually what we're going to try and do with the trial with them in New Zealand. And unfortunately, I think the severe patients who are MEP minus 
we're going to have to do something like what's done for spinal cord injury, uh, some physiological intervention, some pharmacological intervention. But I agree with you. I don't think they're going to behave themselves out of trouble if they have no remaining descending pathway. Yeah. But until then, let's at least give them as much chance as we've given rodents and monkeys. <laughs> yeah, it's just one final comment on. So eventually, we're going to have to get to the point that we're going to start thinking about changing policy and not just the rehabilitation. Because as you know, today, for a patient to get hundreds of hours of rehabilitation is just not realistic in our current funding climate of rehabilitation. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's true. I mean, I think we're just going to have to um, change. I think technology may allow it so that one therapist can treat three or four patients simultaneously. Uh, but, and then maybe we can have technology in the room so when everyone goes home at night or they are at the weekends left alone, that the families can play virtual reality games with them. So before we get CMS to change the billing, I think we're going to have to do technology and do an Uber on current care. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the talk. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Bye.